Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alexandra Lipman. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in, uh, at UC Davis with the Innovating Communication and Scholarship Project affiliated with uh, STS and Anthropology. And we, or Michael and I basically, had the idea for this panel as a way to think about um, both the role of UC Davis um, and how UC Davis is uh, such a sort of, and California actually in general, uh, such a hub for international scholarship and the scholars that we have as part of our researcher community um, enrich the university because of their diverse uh, experiences, perspectives, and knowledges. So uh, we have an interdisciplinary panel. Um, everyone has, if not currently, a tie to California. Um, and this will be more a conversation rather than kind of formal presentations. I'll ask a couple of questions, and then I encourage you, the audience, to kind of join the conversation and ask our panelists questions as well. Um, so let's see. So starting at the end, we have Nup uh, Nupur Raval. She is a graduate student at UC Irvine in informatics. And then uh, Carlos Andres Baragan, a recent graduate in STS and anthropology. He's also, he's based at UC Davis. Uh, Luis Felipe Murillo um, is currently in Paris at uh, CNAM, and he uh, received his PhD from UCLA in anthropology. And uh, Ji Zheng uh, is from UC Davis, uh, based in the School of Medicine. So I'm happy to have uh, such a wonderful panel, emerging scholars, more senior voices, kind of expertise on open access, um, open source software, uh, open data. So my first question is, um, how does your research or work engage with questions of or debates around openness? Uh, do you want to start off first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I'm just going to use the question you asked to say something that I wanted to earlier and we didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which, which stayed with me a little bit because I, it's a familiar question and it's about plagiarism. And um, I draw on my previous experiences uh, working for, um, in some capacities, uh, for the Wikimedia Foundation and basically trying to train people to use and edit, contribute knowledge, open knowledge to Wikipedia articles in uh, non-English, in Indian languages. Um, and there was this large pilot project that happened in India, and uh, one of the biggest complaints that came out very early in the project was that all the high school students who were being asked to contribute to these articles were plagiarizing. And um, there were several reasons as to why they were plagiarizing, one of them being that they were just not educated or trained enough as to how to contribute to Wikipedia. But it, the, I was reminded of this example because um, I thought that it's important to make the leap from open access as giving access to actually being able to access, right? And those are very, two very different things. So some of my research broadly looks at these, um, the gap between just giving access which could be really through all kinds of ICT for development projects, saying that we're going to make sure that we give people uh, cheap internet or free data or the means and materials to you know, go and use a computer. But then what happens in the field? And I work as a qualitative researcher and I go out in India and I um, study Uber drivers in India. And you know, so I look at technology use very closely, especially among people who are not seen as um, like upper class or middle class um, educated um, people, but actually low income individuals who also have sometimes low literacy. And just looking at the technology use, I'm always reminded of this gap that I think we need to address and highlight, which is between 
simply giving the means and actually people being able to. And the people being able to part can really you know, happen or not happen based on things that we already know um, and are exacerbated, especially in the Global South context, which is, you know, like there are, like the hoax uh, trope, there is also, you know, these recurrent articles in India about women being banned from using mobile phones in villages and towns and cities and so on. Um, and, and again, so it's, it's sort of a reminder that it's not about simply saying that this happens in a territory, but saying that technology use starts at some point and then like ends or has a life and an unimagined use in a certain um, territory, which all count as questions of access. That's all. I'll just yeah. go down the line, <laughs> Andres. Okay, so thanks for having me. Um, my research, it's a, an ethnographic and archival project that basically follows um, life scientists that are collecting um, genetic samples from individuals belonging to contemporary ethnic minorities and pre-Columbian gro groups across Colombia and other parts of South America. They are uh, sequencing and characterizing their DNA for ancestry and biomedical studies. In my research, I'm addressing the primary question of what is considered human biological and cultural diversity in the encounters between these life scientists that can be biologists, epidemiologists, geneticists, medical doctors, and members of uh, ethnic groups sample. We're talking about Afro-descendants, indigenous people, mestizos, whites. I've been answering this question through uh, multi-sided ethnography and archival work among uh, life scientists, life, life scientists uh, located in Bogota, Colombia, London, England, and whose uh, research projects and networks focus on these uh, Colombian populations. I've been using uh, fieldwork observation, open-ended interviews, and textual analysis of scientific literature uh, to document and analyze how ideas of mixture, ancestry, ethnicity, and race inform two main interconnected, interconnected processes. The first one is how life scientists design population sampling uh, strategies and produce uh, and disseminate human genomic data. And the second one, how ethnic minority groups enroll in ancestry and biomedical studies understand, appropriate, or contest genomic knowledge, whether, in they, whether they are enrolled as donors uh, or patients. In my research, I've been able to provide evidence that in the networks analyzed, scientists in London and Colombia uh, sorry, um, they set together in motion uh, a particular representation of biologi biological capital understood as diversity as well. Uh, that in turn have deep epistemological and political impact on how the scientific study and governance of human diversity is carried out. In the case of life scientists, the research demonstrates how uh, in their efforts to uh, distance genomic mapping practices from colonial and racial taxonomies and racism, Researchers often over relied on concepts like ethnicity, which in theory are thought to be less controversial. This political and epistemological maneuver is undertaken without considering that the dependency on ethnicity also defines the form and the content of what human genomics is supposed to be offering DNA donors in terms of objective narratives about their biological identities and biomedical risks. In the case of ethnic minorities, uh, the research uh, provides uh, evidence that uh, contesting and appropriating objective scientific claims is not as appealing uh, to some ethnic minorities, political organizations, and leaders in Colombia as it is for life scientists. What is politically valuable to Colombian minorities, however, is the possibility of governing access to biodi bi biodiversity including human biodiversity within their own territories. This particular attempt at governing biotechnology, 
biotechnological enterprises greatly informs the indigeneity of ethnic minorities, which is understood as a way of being indigenous through the lens of ethnic autonomy, governance, and sovereignty. The encounter between ethnic minorities and life scientists poses an interesting problem for open uh, data sets, for example, in terms that their bodies, the cell lines produced, and the digital sequences coming out of their bodies travel in different ways and creates different problems when scientists are sharing uh, data sets and creating collective projects with other scientists across Latin America or in the US, scientists at Stanford University or with their colleagues at London. Right now, the challenge is for some ethnic minorities how to govern the way in which their genetic information is appropriated and used for comparative uh, research projects in several different studies and forces them to uh, create legal strategies to uh, control um, intellectual property or to use uh, informed consent or uh, prior consultation as legal mechanisms to uh, control um, unexpected um, uses of this uh, genomic information. So from, as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist, understanding how um, the production of genomic knowledge aggregates and disaggregates individuals and populations, uh, the encounter between these scientists and ethnic minorities as they uh, try to understand what diversity uh, means in biomedical or ancestry studies uh, forces me to realize uh, that open access creates uh, a huge problem, a problem that uh, scientists themselves can no longer control that well because right now they are uh, relying more and more often on digital uh, DNA sequences than they did before. And since uh, access to contemporary DNA from ethnic minorities is so contested, well, the uh, uses they're uh, doing from stored samples or already sequenced uh, DNA uh, becomes highly problematic. Um, I've been uh, thinking um, a lot about the question that um, Alexander posed, um, and I thought that uh, an interesting way to to, to organize the, my um, exposition would be to think uh, in terms of a trajectory, my trajectory and the trajectory of my colleagues is studying uh, free and open source technologies. Um, uh, as, as, as a matter of, of as a question of, of method, uh, trajectories are interesting for us to think um, in terms of how they intersect with different domains of production of the electronic commons. So many of us in this room, we have um, many experiences to, to report with respect to our participation in, in different communities producing uh, public resources, uh, digital objects of different natures for different communities. So um, I, I, I was when I was uh, when I, I I found myself thinking about this question. I uh, the, the question of openness for me had uh, basically uh, two two potential directions. Um, one in terms of what openness means uh, for us participating in these communities, but also what openness does. What 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 happens when we slap the term open to a certain object, be it uh, data or or um, or, um, or a piece of software, or um, or uh, any other resource, or even like a, a piece of hardware. So um, when it comes to openness, I thought about uh, three potential basic forms that open, openness would, would take in, in our trajectories. And I, I will present in a rather a schematic form, just for, for, for the sake of, um, 
of the presentation, but uh, they, uh, they actually intersect. So openness as a, as a problem which has to be addressed through collective action. So act, prob, uh, openness as, as a political, uh, uh, essentially a political question. Uh, the second one would be uh, openness as an object of inquiry, which is how do we operationalize the notion of openness in, in our scholarship. And the third one would be um, the idea of uh, openness as a project, which has to be advanced uh, through um, the work that we do in academia to mobilize forces and, and, and carry on projects that are um, we do for, for the sake of openness, to open uh, resources, uh, academic resources, to open, uh, to provide access uh, to knowledge. So in this, in this three basic forms, uh, I, I could um, describe uh, uh, elements of my trajectory which are not uh, specific to myself, but I think they, 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 uh, they have to do with uh, the, the experience of, um, of, 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 of a generation, of a group of people who uh, got exposed to free and open source technologies um, from the late 90s to the present. So uh, when it comes to the first uh, form that I, I, I said, uh, I suggested the idea of openness as a problem, everything started for me and for many people in Brazil uh, in, in the context of the free software movement. It was gr um, growing in a country like by the, by the late 90s. Everything happened in the context of the anti-globalization movement. So the World Social Forum was, was a site in which many uh, social movements um, um, con congregate around the question of using openness as a means for um, fighting the, the transnationalization of the intellectual property regime. So it was, uh, uh, first and foremost, a political question that we were engaged at the time. And, and that, that was my very first um, uh, uh, encounter with the question of openness. Uh, and, and from that experience, I. I, I made a poverty vow, a conscious poverty vow, to become a, a social scientist. At the time, I was working as a computer uh, technologist, and, uh, and I, I said, I'm, I'm going to pursue a career in Brazil as a, uh, um, a social scientist. And the question of openness for me became no, no, not only the, the political question, but uh, an object of inquiry. So I started to study social sciences. I, I pursued a degree in Brazil in, in anthropology. So I started to think about uh, how to, to mobilize uh, the, the, the theoretical and the methodological um, tools I had at, at my disposal in my training in anthropology to, to, to think about, the, to, to analyze the question of openness. And then openness became, in the context of the free and open source development, a, a very interesting uh, notion because it, it, it is part of, a, it, is, it, it provides you access to a, a tension, which has to do with the, with the rhetoric of openness, the idea that uh, in these communities we're all welcome to join and all welcome to participate, um, whereas these, com these very communities which uh, foster this discourse of openness and, 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 and access and, and, um, uh, to, uh, uh, I suppose this, this discourse of, of being uh, entirely open and permeable to, to, for people to participate. The, the, the flip side is that they are very, um, they rely on very, um, elite forms of technical knowledge. And, 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 and the barriers of entry are actually quite high depending on the, the domain of the, uh, of the open uh, community, uh, the open community that you actually engage with. So it's, this very tension is, is, is expressed uh, in, in, in the question of openness for these communities. And Nupur, uh, uh, you, you have a lot of experience with this working with the Wikimedia Foundation and also we worked for a community, for, a, for an NGO called um, Data Initiative which is a feminist organization dealing with this very question that in open communities, uh, in free software community, the free culture community, um, there's much more um, harassment. Uh, um, um, uh, it, it is, uh, there are very strong barriers of access. There are very ugly dynamics that uh, the rhetoric doesn't let it uh, percol as surface. So it's, it, we made this, all these tensions invisible through the rhetoric of openness and, and this um, attempt to bring people, to, to, to interpolate people and bring them to the community. So um, this is the, the second question, that when, when, it, uh, when the openness becomes an object of inquiry. And, and to finish, the last one is the idea that 
uh, after doing the research, we, we, um, we have enough uh, knowledge of these communities and their dynamics, uh, their, their forms of exchange and their um, uh, dynamics of production, of collective production, to actually participate in them in and in in um, in provide a help in a very substantial way. And that's how I, I made a, a full circle. I returned to the community after my PhD, and I engaged in different projects to, to, to advance um, the project of, of providing access to knowledge um, uh, in, in, from, from the perspective of, of a researcher from the global south, but also participating in, in communities, in, 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 in research institutes uh, of the global north. And I, I engaged in different projects, uh, an open access publication in anthropology. Uh, I also uh, I worked, uh, collaborated with uh, Kim and Mike Fortune uh, in the development of the dig digital platform to support collaborative research in anthropology. And more recently, I started to, um, to work with colleagues to start uh, an open access journal for open hardware. So the idea is that we, we're, we, we're going to put together um, a platform to create a culture of hardware sharing in the sciences, but also to, to foster the circulation of good documentation, hardware documentation, outside the sciences as well. So these three basic forms, I think, are interesting for us to think um, the, 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 the question of openness as, as a political problem, as an object of inquiry, and as a project that engages us to, to bridge what we do in academia with the work that we do outside academia. So, yeah. to turn it off. Can you hear me? All right. So, as uh, Alexandra introduced, I work for a school of medicine as a faculty member. So, um, to to add to the excellent discussion, as such, um, I'm going to just tell you my um, experience today up to now and um, tell you. Um, not about my shower and breakfast, particularly my wife is sitting in the audience, but instead just tell you the part that is related to open access publication um, and uh, uh, through that to share with you my view and uh, experience about um, open access publication. So, you know, this morning when I get up, uh, uh, realizing er, uh, later today I have this session, I open up my email and I saw one request for a manuscript from an online journal. And uh, um, by the time I came here, about half an hour ago, I accumulated uh, two emails like that. And there's a third email asking me to uh, provide peer review on a manuscript. And there's another one asking me to do um, editorial handling of a manuscript. So I will tell you where they are and um, uh, what I did. So the two requests, the first one came from a journal that uh, I have never heard of. And I, I started by saying, uh, uh, dear doctor, sir, uh, or madam, <laughs> given your prominent uh, uh, reputation, we'll be, be delighted to receive a manuscript, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I deleted it right away. The second one uh, uh, knows my name. It, it starts with uh, Dear Dr. Zhang. And then it mentioned one of uh, our papers published a few years back in a um, high profile journal and they said, uh, based on your experience and knowledge, we want you to send us your next manuscript on a similar topic. It's all right, but uh, when I look at the journal, it's on a totally different topic from what we published, which was a very focused study in a, in a very special area of uh, medicine. So it's totally unrelated, and uh, clearly that was uh, a phishing, so I delete that. So two emails down, and then come to the one that they re, uh, uh, invite me to review a manuscript. So. Uh, because I, I, I have in my mind I'm doing this, so I thought I should be um, more um, uh, exploratory and see what this journal is. So this is a journal, uh, journal uh, uh, with a name, International Journal of something I already fucked up right now. <laughs> but I can tell you when I, when I get on their website, 
There's no ISSN number. They claim they are going to get it soon. And I get on their editorial board page. I saw 10 of them, three without a picture. So um, again, this is something that doesn't uh, look right. And then when, when I look at the manuscript, it's on something that is totally unrelated to what I'm doing. So I sent back a uh, uh, email saying that I'm now qualified to review. So the third one is done. So the last one came from uh, scientific reports. It's a, it's a journal published by Springer Nature. It's a very um, uh, popular journal, uh, at least uh, uh, in, in our field, but it's a very general scientific uh, journal. And I serve on the ed editorial board, and they asked me to handle a submission. So there, um, uh, I, I look at the paper, it's on a, uh, a mechano-sensing molecule in the bladder. So, so I'm not working on uh, how the bladder sense the pressure, so we, we go to the bathroom to take a pee, but uh, uh, we are working on um, proteins that sense uh, uh, different uh, uh, sensations. So, so it is in my area of expertise, so I decided I, I can handle that. So I did. So I take that, uh, read the, uh, the submission, and uh, quickly I, I think of uh, the people I know who are qualified to reveal it. I send it to two um, uh, colleagues uh, and invite them to review the manuscript. The first one is a young scientist in Beijing. I knew him because he just published a paper in Nature on the structure of one of those t uh, mechanical sensing protein. So he's highly qualified, I sent him an email. And I invite another uh, colleague uh, uh, in the States uh, who also studied mechanical sensing. Um, so shortly before lunch, I got an email back from the, uh, the American uh, colleague. He said uh, he's too busy writing grants and um, working on papers. So he, he, he was, he's too busy to reveal it. So too bad, I have to find somebody else. But he did uh, um, refer a colleague uh, who I didn't know very well, but he, he mentioned there's this uh, scientist in, in Germany who also work on this topic. So I quickly checked that in our uh, journal database, sure enough. This guy is, uh, uh, is working in this area for many years. So I sent him an email, and I thought I better have a backup. So I, I, uh, I sent another email to a uh, scientist uh, in Australia, a, a younger scientist, but it, uh, has the experience and uh, qualified to review. So, now I'm still waiting for them to get back to me. Hopefully I will get at least two so I can uh, move on with the, the review process. So you, you can see it's not, a, this is not a, 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 a euro day just because I pay attention. Indeed, uh, um, this is uh, quite a typical day. So uh, every day we see information coming in, and for me, as uh, this kind of request for uh, 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 manuscript or request for review, and we are dealing with open uh, access publication on a daily basis. For myself, as I said, I, I um, serve for uh, open access journal. Uh, not only one, but two. One is a uh, uh, scientific report. I don't even know where it, it, it is. It, it is an uh, international, uh, truly international journal, branching off from Nature for that, maybe as a European journal. And uh, I'm also on editorial board for uh, a Protein and Cell. It's, um, it's a, a journal published in China. Uh, uh, and it's, it's affiliated with Springer as well. So, uh, so far, it remains to be open access. It's totally free. But it, I know the journal has a goal after they gain their reputation. Once they get the recognition, they may start to 
to charge um, uh, officers for a fee. So, so um, and I'm on the third editorial board for a society journal, the American Physiological Society. It's a much smaller journal, uh, but it, uh, it's, uh, it's American journal for, for the uh, society. So what I can see is that these days, we are dealing open access, no matter it is uh, truly uh, uh, online only, open access journal, or the classic traditional journal. So the, uh, the society journal I'm working with uh, has um, 99 years uh, history already. Next year is the, uh, the, uh, the big year, and uh, there are a lot of uh, plans for celebration, but that journal, we are um, uh, putting things online, and we are thinking about how to deal with the reality that uh, everything is online. So not only that uh, uh, the scientific journals publish things online. You, these days, you can publish um, yourself, right? So indeed, uh, to, to put something on the internet uh, doesn't cost uh, much anymore. So if, if, uh, everybody can really put it up on your web page so people can, can uh, see it if they can find it. So, so then why people want to publish in the journals? either the, uh, the open access journal uh, or uh, traditional journal. So I, I think uh, what we want is the recognition, the peer review, and, uh, uh, and uh, come with it that recognition of uh, the, the um, uh, recognition that uh, this is uh, something that is scholarly uh, uh, recognized. Right. And of course, a publish in high profile journal has the advantage that uh, you can reach to a larger audience. But it, that um, is not only restricted to the traditional flashy uh, journal like Nature and Science. Quite a few online journals are uh, uh, able to achieve the same goal. For example, uh, in, in my area, there is a journal, uh, eLife. eLife doesn't have a very long history, but it is very recognized that, uh, by, by all the biomedical researchers because it's, uh, it's holding itself at a very high standard. It's supported by uh, many institutions, including Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Max Planck, and the uh, Wellcome Trust of the UK. So, and it's supported by the top scientists, the, the people that I know, the, the leader of my field, they sent their papers there. So it's a pure online uh, journal, open access to everybody. And on top of that, um, uh, very unusual case for open access journal, it doesn't charge the authors a penny. It can mm -hmm. do that, of course, because Howard Hughes, Max Planck, they, they put the resource down to support that. So that's a very successful uh, open access journal. And of course, we know uh, the PLAS. PLAS Biology, PLAS uh, Genetics, mm -hmm. those are uh, very prominent journals. We all want our work to be published there. And uh, the list doesn't uh, stop there. There are many very high quality open access journals that um, we, we like to, to uh, send our stuff there. Um, myself, uh, my lab published in both traditional journals and open access journals. Uh, frankly, we don't look at journals just by whether they print a paper copy or not. Uh, we, we consider whether it is in our field, whether by publishing there, our work can reach the audience we want to reach, and of course, the reputation of the journal. So, Really, the, uh, the open access, I think, is a great thing. And uh, um, I think it's uh, making it a lot easier for us to reach um, the audience we want uh, uh, to, to um, tell our story, our uh, research. And it's something, uh, I, I think, really, the open access is, uh, is integrating the international research field. The, uh, the, uh, um, 
all over the world, we, we are all connected through the open access. So maybe I should start. Okay, thank here. you. Um, and my second question is a, sort of a two-part question. Um, uh, how have your open practices, whether it's around um, open access or free open source software or open data, been shaped by working and studying in both the global north and the global south? Um, and how do you see attitudes around open access maybe shifting as models of open access are in the process of, of, of changing as well? Uh, Newford? Um, thank you. So um, the first part about sort of being a transnational scholar and um, the experiences with open access um, again, reminds me of the fact that um, before I applied to grad school, um, the only sort of publication that I had was with um, a feminist journal, media studies journal called um, the Ada Journal of New Media. And it's, it's an open access journal, and it was relatively young and new. And um, at that point, so what's interesting is that until I was in India doing research, um, I, I wasn't exactly sure if the way I was doing research, the places I was publishing at, the people I was speaking to, was the traditional or the right way to do it, to be a legit academic, basically. And why I say so is because, um, despite being published in that journal, being a peer-reviewed journal, um, going through all the rigor of um, a journal article, just the fact that um, the journal was a new journal, it's, you know, so it's embedded in a sort of political economy of things that are absolutely essential, doesn't even matter. So I think that's where the traditional journals have a little bit of um, uh, advantage, but is, is that it totally, totally matters who is on the board of it. And, you know, I'm not going to keep in emphasizing on these things because we've spoken enough today about these things, but, it was really a realization that um, while I thought that the article was excellent and clearly people who peer reviewed it thought it was fine, um, just the fact that it hasn't been cited as much as the article that I've written after coming to the US, being at a US institution, understanding the rigors and the traditional venues at which information science scholars go in the US and then pretty much publishing the, the same kind of work, you know, done by the same person, gets a very different kind of traction. And so that is sort of one straight off the bat issue that I wanted to talk about. And the other thing being that, um, and this is not something that I had realized until I came to the US, was um, that when, at least when I was in India and in the circle I was surrounded by the academics, uh, we had very different understanding of what we had access to. And this again is, I think, widely felt by everybody in the Global South, which is that you cannot afford to be an independent scholar, right? You have mm -hmm. to either be affiliated to an institution or you have to have friends who can go to a JSTOR and get you articles and send them to you. Um, so again, sort of bringing in those little bit of issues about you know what counts as privacy or what uh, piracy or what counts as uh, illegitimate access, um, they, they weren't as much ethical concerns as they were more practical concerns. Like, how are you going to go about doing academic research if you don't have access to all of these things? And something that's remarkable that I've noticed after coming to um, the US is that I don't ask these questions anymore because I'm so incredibly privileged to be in a university, you know, where, like, I do this exercise on a daily basis, which is go check my library catalog and sort of try and, you know, bet with myself saying, I bet this book isn't in the library. And then it's there, right? <laughs> and then, of course, papers and things like that, they're, all of them are subscribed to. And I, I won't go into the politics or the difficulties that the UC system is already encountering with, you know, journal subscriptions and funding and things like that. But that's also something to think about. So I think that now I've become this transnational entity that, that sources the articles and journal papers and books for my <laughs> peers back home. Um, so that's, that's one way it has worked out. And the other way that it has worked out, which is not so much about scholarship, but about um, navigating funding and possibilities, right? Because I think questions of 
giving access and getting access and who doesn't have access, like a little bit like what Kavita said in the morning, are not so innocent questions because first we need to stage, first we need to mm -hmm. tell people who doesn't have access, you know, first we need to sort of create the information poor to be able to give them access and hence make a development project out of it. So in that sense also, it's been very interesting because when, um, and I think this notion still remains to some extent in India especially, which is that you aren't a reputed or legitimate scholar if you haven't gone to the US or Europe and gotten a PhD and gotten a tenure track position. There's a clear hierarchy in some sense. It's not so rigid and concrete, but it used to be definitely very hierarchical. Um, and, and as things change in terms of the global political economy of academia, the way people from India who go to the US to get a PhD, the way people back home see us has also changed, right? So we're still seen as people who clearly want to take advantage of the first world institutions and their resources, and which makes it difficult for us as citizens of one country to get any kinds of funding back home because we're seen as more privileged as uh, than the people who are back home. But at the same time, we don't qualify for most of the funding in the US because we're not citizens. And so that, that um, it's just, again, it's not to point fingers at you know, an institution or a country, but it's to say that at times when you hear really funny speeches and really stereotypical sounding projects, I think they are the outcomes of these structures that make you say certain things if you want funding or if you want to be published. Because like, again, earlier someone in the panel said in the morning, it totally matters where you're situated who, and who you are vis-a-vis -vis what you get to say. And this is at least true for my discipline. So I'll stop here. Great. Um, I've been a puzzle but trying to map out how my own daily practices as an anthropologist and a historian of science and technology engage consciously or unconsciously uh, openness. Alexandra Liebman is the one to blame, but also the one I need to thank. Here I'm talking about leaving aside an, an essentialist reading of anthropology and tracking what anthropologists really do in terms of labor and intellectual property. Uh, such a challenge requires to situate social relations, a la Haraway, in the form of discourses and practices as they unfold in places uh, that not always are grounded geographically. We have little time to dwell on what concepts frame better the challenges and essence of interconnected stories of colonialism, neo-imperialism, and neoliberalism in the so-called third world, and the role in understanding knowledge production practices today. Enough to say that I'm more comfortable with framing such lived experience in terms of hegemony and subalternization, rather than through dichotomies such as centers versus peripheries or north versus south. Overemphasizing a geographical dimension uh, risks having a chance to think about the in the making configuration uh, structuring the ways in which anthropologies trade in affects, disdain, interest, intellectual property, militancy, resources, politics, passions, both locally and globally. Anthropology, in singular, and imagined as disciplinary genealogy, does not travel to different parts, nation states around the world, adapting to local milieu. It is us, practitioners, who do the legwork of, or the virtual online traveling. It is me, the one following a sometimes elusive network connecting human geneticists in Bogota, London, Stanford, and less known places like Leticia in the Colombian Amazon. Yet, for the case of anthropology, several colleagues have pointed out the conformation of several local, regional, national anthropological networks that differ in terms of their agendas, engagements, methodologies, institutional frameworks, and politics. Literature talks about national traditions, styles, schools, but less so about transnational anthropological fields. However, such diversity is as paradoxical as a 1990s Benetton advertisement embracing racial fraternity. 
a closer engagement with such anthropological diversity or anthropologies in plural, if we follow Arturo Escobar or Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, evidence that the visibility and audibility of other anthropological traditions are far from being equal. Asymmetry is both the form and content in which individuals practice within a transnational anthropological field. Some traditions are more visible and set the patterns for a participation within it. An attempt to address the two questions offered by Alexandra to articulate the conversation in this panel does must start with my personal experience and consideration of such a symmetry. As an anthropologist holding a Colombian passport and therefore nationality, more often than not, it is assumed, for example, by funding agencies that the logic place to do fieldwork for me is Colombia. Some colleagues also assume that Colombia is the natural place for me to return to to return to after my PhD training here in the US. By default, structural asymmetries circumscribe my future labor and intellectual production in local terms, but not global ones. As a non-resident alien scholar working and studying at institutions in both the global north and the global south, most of the time I'm the embodiment of the local rather than one of the global. Such lived experience matters to the general topic of this fine event in the sense that the intellectual world that I produce is governed by default by the similar or parallel logics. In order to be a professional anthropologist in Colombia, you must read the work of Clifford Geertz, but in order to be a professional anthropologist in the US, no one has to read Virginia Gutierrez de Pineda or Gregorio Hernandez de Alba. The fact that you are wondering who they are helps my argument. <laughs> These two Colombian anthropologists and their work could become relevant if anthropologists in, in research institutions in countries, in, sorry, in countries like the US, England, or France uh, are specifically interested in matters of family studies, social organization in Colombia, or interested in pre-Columbian societies that inhabited that territory. After finishing my undergraduate training as an anthropologist in Bogota, soon I started working as a research contractor for the Colombian Institute of Anthropology and History. Soon, also, I became aware of databases such as JSTOR. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that I thought about it as El Dorado. <laughs> the new world of academic resources for an anthropologist that knows by heart the limitations of public and private libraries, even in Bogota, about anthropological materials produced for the country. When a visiting graduate student offered me his credential to remotely access the digital resources available to the University of Chicago, the only thing that I can say is that I spent entire days only downloading. I was PDF hungry. <laughs> After all, there was no way I could pay at the time $12 for one article. Curiously enough, at that time, staff and researchers at the Colombian Institute of Anthropology, we were engaged in a debate to whether the institute should make available online or not all its current and past publications, books, and journals. Already an unapologetic PDF lover, me and the other colleagues suggested that the publications should be made available for downloading on the Institute's website free of charge. Our logic was that by making the publications available online, the overall goal of the Institute, disseminating academic research on the archaeological, historical, and anthropological heritage of the country, could be increased to multiply audiences beyond academia. On the other hand, there could be a chance to make visible the work of national anthropologists outside the country to those other traditions and practitioners that consider our work difficult to get and therefore impossible to dialogue with or cite. I, tr I truly thought we had a win-win situation. However, the open access idea was received poorly. Senior researchers at the Institute expressed concern about opening the gates of plagiarism. Others expressed that we were missing a chance to get even with international researchers by making them pay for our knowledge. 
It took a lot of time and effort to make them realize that plagiarism can take place with a hard copy and has nothing to do with the digital form proposed for the dissemination of the academic product. Counter arguments were made to show that if our goal was to make some pesos out of the publications to get even for asymmetries in the political economy of anthropological knowledge, we could punish more relevant audiences by restricting their access. After all, if a peasant or an indigenous person was interested in reading a research article that talks about them, one that most likely they helped to build with their testimonies, will it be fair to make them pay? Moreover, since the institute is founded by the state, aren't these peasants and indigenous communities already contributing with their taxes to the funds that made possible the research in the first place? A long story short, since 2008, the Institute has been implementing a model for, of dissemination in which some of the publications are made available online right away, like journal articles, and they offer an embargo of two years on some of the books produced, for example. Plagiarism has not increased, although I'm not aware if researchers and staff are keeping track. On the other hand, citation indexes of the work of Colombian anthropologists published in Spanish and made available online free of charge, has not dramatically increased in Anglo or Franco-speaking traditions, despite the fact that it has been available online. I think that open models for the production of research and dissemination of a scholarship indeed facilitate the foster uh, or foster a dialogic exchange between different research communities themselves and between these and other audiences. However, a scholarly openness by itself cannot change asymmetries in how the work of research, researchers is valued and positioned in systems of power knowledge. This takes place among the antros, my kin, but also among human geneticists, the tribe where I'm trying to go native. Thank you. Um, uh, my, my experience uh, resonates um, very much with Nepur and Carlos. Um, I just have a few m more things to add, I would say. Um, um, I would start with the question of open access in Brazil um, and with a confession. <laughs> Uh, I was very much, um, as I said in the beginning of, uh, of the other, um, responding to the previous question, I, everything started for me and for a whole group, for a whole generation, um, with, uh, with uh, the, the question of creating alternatives to, to the intellectual property regime, to create uh, projects to, to fight the intellectual property regime. And we were very much immersed in this debate in the late 90s. Uh, but at the same time, uh, open access was not a question for me at all. And it wasn't a question for my colleagues at all. And the reason is because of the amazing work that Solange and many people at Cielo did for the Brazilian social sciences. We had access to amazing journals in anthropology through Cielo. And for us, it was a problem solved. We wouldn't, you know, uh, open access wouldn't be a banner, wouldn't be a question for us to, to fight for. But we had other uh, things to, to, to fight um, against um, in the domain of biotech, in the domain of the um, information technology, uh, corporations, and so forth and so on. So uh, this is my experience in Brazil with respect to open access. And when I came to uh, the United States, uh, I remember being um, uh, facing uh, the, 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 the um, being, being a, uh, a, Really, um, I, had, I was speechless uh, with the fact that I had access to everything, and and this uh, this idea, this this thing of being really privileged with access, uh, also uh, put me in this position of being a person like Napur who would be downloading articles from my colleagues in Brazil and sending over email all the time, uh, and 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 my trajectory, and again, trajectories are important for us to think about this this because we get into the the the, the politics of knowledge and these um, uh, uh, major structures um, and, and and questions that are imposed to us, like they, they, they have a force that we don't actually get to choose. We end up doing things that are open in like a realm of possibilities, but there are limited possibilities in front of us. 
And I, in Brazil, I happened to work with a, a Brazilian anthropologist who was an anthropologist of politics and religion. Uh, he's a, f a fascinating Brazilian anthropologist, Carlos Tayo. And he happened to be, at the time, um, the person who helped to uh, push for the installa multi-installations of uh, open journal systems, uh, open journal system for the whole university. So they had a program called SER, which was basically a multi-install of OJS. And many people in different departments and different disciplines were running their own open access journals. So that, that was part of my experience in Brazil. And, and I didn't know about this until uh, just a few weeks ago that I was uh, uh, um, hanging out with him. And he said, oh, you know, like I was actually one of the key people like pushing for the, for the open OJS installation in our university back then. And I was, oh, <laughs> and I was working with him for a long time. So open access was not very much of a question for me in Brazil, even though I was immersed in the debate about intellectual property and, and, the, and the struggle uh, to, to create a movement around free software in the country back then. Uh, uh, and uh, in the U.S., I happened to work with a researcher from the University of California in Los Angeles, uh, Christopher Kelty, who has been very active in pushing for open access um, UC-wide and the, the University of California system-wide. So he has been a very important, a very vocal um, person pushing for, for open access uh, policies. Um, and it's interesting, when I came to the U.S., uh, for me, one of the uh, crazy things was to see that the situation of anthropology was completely different from the reality of the discipline that I knew in Brazil. And one of the things that was, for me, was striking back then was the, 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 the information that I got from Chris Kelty, a person I was working with, that uh, our discipline, anthropology, was, was being held captive by a predatory, uh, monopolistic, uh, big publishing company with this secret uh, contract uh, uh, that was uh, signed by the uh, American Anthropological Association. So the situation in terms of the lock-in, the corporate lock-in for, for um, uh, academic publications in our discipline was very, very different from the context in Brazil. So for me, it was a big, a big contrast. Uh, it was something that got me thinking a lot about, uh, about the question of access. and. Um, and then when it comes to the question of free software, it was also very striking the difference between the two, the possibilities of studying free software in Brazil and the possibility of studying free software in the United States. Um, the uh, Brazilian anthropology uh, is a discipline, it's, it's, it does a type of anthropology that is an anthropology of Brazil. So Brazilian anthropology is an anthropology of Brazil mostly. It, it is changing a little bit now, uh, um, in the past few years, but uh, mostly it's, it is a, an anthropology studying Brazilian uh, communities and Brazilian questions and issues. When, it, when I moved to the United States, the, uh, the anthropology here, of course, is, is an anthropology that is, is, is it turned outwards, not inwards. And, and then the push to go study in different countries, in different contexts, is, is very strong. So for me, it was, again, another contrast. And um, I end up studying free software, not going back to Brazil to study free software, but to study the relationship between local communities and a transnational space of exchange and production of open source technologies by, looking, uh, by addressing the, the, uh, the network itself, connecting local communities as the, the object of inquiry. Um, and I think that's pretty much uh, sums it up for me in terms of my experience of uh, the, 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 the conditions of production are very, very dis dis distinctive. And, and for me, it was a big contrast navigating disciplinary landscapes in, this, in the United States and Brazil because the contrasts are very, very marked. They're very... Uh... Thank you. Well... Um... My fellow uh, panelists uh, uh, very nicely uh, summarized uh, many uh, uh, aspects that we, we need to consider, you know, the protection of uh, our intellectual property and our scholarly work, uh, whether we should um, uh, pay for what is being published, the, the reputation of the journal, looking at who is on the editorial board. And I, I did that uh, just today. So, and it, um, on top of that, uh, of course, there's this uh, consideration of uh, career development. When we publish something, we want to be recognized uh, for 
to find our next job, to get promotions. Um, we, we want to show our work is being recognized by, one way to do that is to show it's being published in a recognized, um, reputable um, uh, journals, either open access or not. So, so then the choice is uh, where to publish. As I said, it's not hard today to put something in the, on the internet so people can access. Uh, we can easily search uh, information that is now uh, only on the, uh, the highly visible platform. We can search for any web page that is out there. So it's not, um, it's not a problem to have your information being uh, accessible, of course, uh, being on a uh, visible platform has its advantage. So how do we choose for, for uh, a uh, place to publish our work? So not only there are all these journals uh, organized, uh, peer-reviewed for publication, there are also uh, archives where we can just simply deposit what we uh, have produced. So in, in uh, our field, we have this uh, bio-archive. It's relatively new, but it is um, very successful. It's uh, uh, organized by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, and uh, j very recently uh, uh, it got um, in the um, um, Internet, there are a lot of discussion about it because the Chen Zuckerberg initiative, the guy who ran the uh, Facebook, had just uh, signed a huge contract to support that uh, archive thing. So you just write up your paper, you deposit there. And uh, um, I have seen a lot of traditional journals recognize that. They are willing to publish the same work after peer review, after the journal uh, review and recognize the work, they will publish again, recognize that it has been deposited there. So now we have all these options. So how do we choose? So you know, this is where I think things uh, get uh, complicated. I, I came in at the end of the previous session. We talked about uh, how to distinguish uh, predatory journal versus a real authentic journal is complicated, right? So there are different um, uh, views on this and it definitely is not black and white. And um, often um, there are people who are not right in that uh, discipline or field to be able to judge. So how do we do that? Um, a lot of people I talk to uh, when I when I wear the hat of uh, editorial board member, they will tell me that uh, they would send their work to a journal that has a higher impact factor. So, so it, which is uh, calculated by how many citations the paper of a particular journal accumulate over the year. So, of course, uh, if people cite the work published by the journal, that means it's, um, it has an impact. It's recognized. So uh, people like to, to uh, send their work there. And indeed, a lot of people I talk to, our colleagues, says that um, their home institute will set up a bar. If you publish a paper in a journal with an impact factor of five or higher, that count as a certain point. If you publish in a journal with an impact factor one or two, you have less point. And if you publish in Nature or Science, the, the really high impact journal, not only you get a lot of points, you actually, uh, in China, you, you, get, uh, you get a reward in the form of money. And it's, uh, we're talking about China, and even there, the money is, um, is uh, noticed. So um, the, the, we have all this uh, uh, choice to send our work and we also have this uh, judgment when we find a, a piece of a scholar work published in, uh, out there. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, to make sure when we support open access publication, we uh, protect the, uh, the reputation, we protect the uh, intellectual property, and uh, um, it, I, um, I 
don't know uh, uh, what's the best way to do this. I think that's the point of uh, uh, the discussion here. But uh, indeed, it's something I think um, all the supporters of uh, open access publication, this is uh, an important question we need to think about. I think Nupur had a question or Just, point. Uh, <laughs> no, do, it struck me that we haven't, we haven't spoken about labor at all. Um, during the whole day and it just, I guess, would help to throw it in the mix because I think if we continue to sort of frame our observations, our politics and our projects in terms of what should the world look like, um, it's easy to kind of forget who has to do the work to make it so. And I only say this because um, coming a little bit from anthropology and then generally internet studies and media studies and things like that, what's very interesting is that as much as the promise of openness is there, not, not even in terms of institutional access and who gets to publish, but just like really anybody can think about this, you know, they're more democratized disciplines. At the same time, you know, um, the, the increasing validity and legitimacy of blogs you know, where you can also publish. So you can have a 500 word blog post that is ready to go tomorrow and it could be making this one super important and interesting point that's really a provocation and it needs to be out there. And you could do that tomorrow and you could do it sort of every month as against somebody who wants to write a 7,000 word paper and go through the peer review process and then have one journal publication speak on their CV, resume, and so on. And, and I think that's, there's something very interesting going on um, in terms of also the, like the temporal rhythms of disciplines because there are some disciplines that encourage conference proceedings that um, actually are willing to recognize public writing and things like that, which have you know, much faster turnaround time in computer science equally. Uh, but then there are disciplines that actively also discourage their students from publishing right till the point of dissertation. And um, these things also kind of play out in terms of like, you know, to put it very crudely, how much bang are you getting, for, how much buck are you getting for the bang? Like, you know, uh, how much per unit value do you get from a unit of writing? And like, all that is situated in terms of which discipline you're in and who you are. Yeah, that's all. Great, I think we have uh, time for one or two questions and then afterwards uh, there's a reception outside um, so we can continue the conversation over uh, wine and cheese and uh, fresh cherries. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just struck by Nupur, by your, your comment about blogs, and I'm thinking that so much of today has been about the problem of, of attention, and we've talked about it in terms of indexing and how to make content visible, and I'm curious what uh, scholars working in the field think about the role of blogs and other forms of social media, social networks, um, in drawing attention to work that may not be getting the kind of visibility or attracting attention, even if it's indexed, it may not be attracting attention. And is our social media outlets a way of actually creating more visibility for work that isn't really, that isn't seen that well in the, in the global north? There's a um, in the context of the, uh, this, uh, we, we started this initiative, the Journal of Open Hardware. It's a fairly recent uh, initiative we started. And we have been studying, uh, one of the biggest debates we had with the group of editors was about uh, which platform to host the journal. So uh, we don't, uh, we know that the, the traditional uh, structure of an open access journal using OJS or like a traditional publication venue doesn't work for the purposes of publishing hardware documentation for the sciences, for the purposes, for the purposes of replicability of hardware um, um, pieces. So we have been uh, discussing uh, what kind of platform would we need. And there's one interesting experiment, uh, this uh, piece of software called PubPub, which is an attempt to create a more flexible uh, publication uh, platform, which integrates with a more social media aspect to the, to the to the editorial workflow 
uh, within the, the journal. And, and they have also this idea of uh, open uh, peer review, which is interesting, and it's interesting for, for our community in the case. So th this is one potential um, um, experiment that I think it's happening in the context of uh, academic, uh, open access academic publications. So in terms of uh, how do we reinvent the, the, the infrastructures we need to, to reinvent the, the, the uh, forms of scholarly communication, ultimately. And just to add to that, a thing that I did think about, and I'm not sure if this is good or bad, but um, the fact that languages in, like, in pre-digital world, and especially humanities-related research, um, being published had a different kind of world as compared to things coming to the digital. So, you know, uh, having like the font support or having readers who actually consume that kind of content on the internet. So again, sort of being like an Anglophone world being replicated on the internet. So I think that there's some merit definitely that I've seen around to um, alternate kinds of modalities of content being allowed to sort of exist that still aren't considered um, tenure worthy or anything, but they, they allow you to say what you want. So I think blogs definitely have that value. Mm -hmm. Quick response for my I just wanted to say that I was thinking of that not so much as an alternative form of scholarly communication, mm. but as a way of drawing attention because there is more conversation that happens in the Twitter sphere, in the blogosphere, in social media, mm -hmm. it, the discourse is more, more real time, more rapid, and it's a way of drawing attention to work by, by mentioning work, by citing, in a way, work that mm -hmm. is more formally published. So I was thinking more about the relationship between that kind of communication as a, as a way of drawing attention to formal publication. Uh, yes, uh, when I mentioned pop up, I was I was trying. Maybe I didn't explain it well. Uh, the idea is not, not only to try to push for a different form of scholarly communication, but they want to animate conversations around a piece of publication. So that's the whole purpose. So then then you, then you have these different forms of uh, you, you attract much more attention to a particular piece. It Just becomes a live piece, so to speak, and they want to have different. Ver they want to do versioning of the, the of the publication. So the publication is not this static form that we have, it, 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 it is changed and it changes com uh, and according to the conversation around it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Just an interesting piece of information. Um, there's this TV host called Stephen Colbert, right? And he has this famous show. And uh, I don't know how many of you have noticed, but he puts out, I mean, his team puts out all their like daily content on YouTube for free consumption every night. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, despite his monologue being like 15 minutes or so, they always break down the monologue when it comes to YouTube in, term, in four parts, usually three or four parts. And I wasn't sure exactly why they did this because I thought it was probably unsanctioned uploading so someone else was doing it. But turns out that because they, so this is again like the transition to digital, that they understand that a piece of video is a piece of video, and hence, if you have 10,000 views on every part of the monologue, then it can come up to 40,000 <laughs> views. And hence, if you write a book, and then you break it down to five blog posts, it works, yeah. <laughs> um, Mackenzie? The light is green. Okay. No. <laughs> Luis, you touched on this already, but um, I'm curious to hear from others. As researchers who've um, published both in the US and another country, um, for researchers in your field or people that you study, is there a dramatic difference in attitudes about open access publishing here versus the home country or other countries that you've worked in? And why do you think that is? If, is it a platform issue? Is it a recognition issue, what's, what's holding people back? Well, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Indeed, as I um, already alluded to, when we publish something, we want, um, we want the recognition. So where do we send it to? So um, my personal observation of this, um, it seems um, uh, the people I talk to, and I think it, uh, it also applies to myself, is not the format of the, uh, the uh, journal. 
So indeed, a lot of traditional journals are now moving towards the open access uh, format already. Uh, so uh, clearly, this is the trend. So uh, we are not really concerning whether it's open access, uh, access or not, but it, uh, what kind of reputation this journal has and what kind of um, uh, visibility it can bring and what kind of uh, recognition in, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, high profile, low profile. Um, so that's, uh, that seems to play a major role in the decision making process. I, I mentioned the impact factor. Of course, I don't completely agree with that uh, impact factor as a statistical number. Uh, it really reflects more on the journal, not the individual study that is published in it. So, um, yeah, uh, interestingly, um, I, I think people seem, uh, on both sides, both the states and uh, 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 people I, I talked to in China, in, in Japan, in South Korea, in Australia, um, they care about uh, the reputation of the journal, and I think that's uh, a key for supporting open access uh, at the moment. We need to protect the reputation of the, the good open access journals. Um, I think there's an interesting process in Colombia. As, as I said, like we were talking about, I was working there in the two, early 2000s, and we were already <laughs> uploading for free books and articles. Uh, but when it comes down to my own trajectory, there is a fetish about being in the US and publishing in international journals. Uh, matters a lot if I'm gonna pursue a career in Colombia. The other way around, not so much. Uh, if it's published in Spanish, which I have done a lot, it's not that, no, doesn't receive the same kind of value here it's almost non-existent, and we need to address that. It's sad, it doesn't make sense, but it's also structurally coherent with the political economy that I mentioned before about, well, some anthropologies are more visible than others, and for my own ethnographic reflection on genetics, some national uh, networks of geneticists do not have the same sort of recognition that uh, geneticists in powerful uh, universities with a lot of funding. So in that, sen in that sense, my experience as an anthropologist uh, is being mirrored by their experience as uh, also uh, third world uh, geneticists trying to produce a first world class uh, genomic knowledge. <clears throat> Just to add a uh, very classic ethnographic account of what happened, I was, last year I was in Bangalore, India, um, doing some research, and I was talking to someone, and the issue was that mm, Bangalore doesn't have exactly um, the kind of maps that you'd need for some kind of open street map solutions. And I went to talk to these people who work on open street map solutions, and I said, well, why don't you have them? And, you know, like, what kind of exercise would you need to do, which is like, the dirty work of going down in the city on the streets and really collecting that data. And they said, no, this is the job of the local administrative authorities. This isn't our work. What we want is cooperation from governmental authorities, and they should be the ones helping us produce this data. And also, what have they been doing sitting on transport data, which isn't digitized yet? So, you know, it's it's not so much the critique of something, but it's like, how do you reconcile these two moments? Because when we went over to that other office, uh, government officials who have to make 10,000 people transport in the city every day, uh, don't see digitizing those things in the right way as their priority. Also, given that they knew that someone might get transferred within six months or a year to another position, the incentives are very different to do this. So there were like these multiple just breakages and I guess what I understood in terms of like the first worldliness of the people who wanted, all of us who wanted the open data was just that there has to be some kind of a different approach, right? We cannot go there and say your failure is in not having produced the kind of information that can lend itself to the way we think about open access mostly in, in what has originated from the West, yeah.
I guess one more question. Uh, I think I have um, a few things. Um, I think Nepal, the challenge with the South is really the issue of structure. It's not just there. When you come, if you become um, a transnational scholar, when you come to the North, you the things on ground that you find. And so going back home, there is a lacuna. And you, you just can't fill it up overnight. And the people you're dealing with do not see what you're demanding. So they really don't find it that easy. So we need, we need structures, actually. And we need to start thinking, and which bring my question to you, that um, now, now that you have encountered the double tragedy of n two Indian to be American and two American to be Indian, what do you think we should do? <laughs> How do you bring that home? <laughs> that's one. On um, no, we're on the spot. That's, that, that's one, <laughs> uh, OK? Uh, because you're now an academic bat. You're not a bird. You're not a mama. So what are you? <laughs> So how do we solve that? We need to solve that. Because you have a set of people returning, but they're not accepted. And they think you want to prove that you know too much, isn't it? And that's, that's the idea. That, uh, who do you think you are? Just stay there. We are the people on ground. And for Felipe, I, now, talking impact, I always have believed that uh, one of the ways to check the uh, impact factor issue is to open impact beyond academic citation. And really, we must bring impact to the society. So I want to agree with Ivy. And, but how do we really do that? Can we begin to pull impact of uh, use by the man on the street, on his cell phone? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? We need to create that. How do we need to make it count. Because you can throw out something and just leave a space. We need something to fill in. We all agree that the impact factor as it is, is not good, mm. good enough. But how do we do that? Um, now, for Je, uh, reputation of journals. OK, now, if you talk about reputation, most of rep journals' reputation are in the north. How do we build reputation for journals in the south? We need to build reputation. For me, I don't think we should just, we need to do things, we start doing things. And so how do we really start getting solutions if we need to do that? And then, of course, for Andres, um, now, I think your idea of openness and human digital uh, molecular data, uh, you, from what I get, there's a situation of creating digital voodooism, where that's what peop what indigenous people are afraid of. Somebody sees somewhere and manipulate my data. I manipulate my genes without my knowledge. So you created a, a digital voodooism of some sort. How do we sort that out? What do we do, therefore? Right, Thank I you. I would love you to give them time to, to respond. Wow. Um, to the, to the panel. Mm -hmm. Is there a who wants to start? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, um, I will pick up two of the questions you mentioned. So one is the, about the citation, uh, impact factor thing. I totally agree with you. Impact factor is not everything, but uh, a lot of people find it uh, to be convenient, especially the, say, administrators of the uh, School of Medicine who may now understand every research discipline and uh, uh, what we really study. So having that kind of uh, numerical standard might be very useful. So, uh, but of course it's not just citation that reflects the impact of the work. And these days people realize that, uh, for example, there is this um, research gate. It's a very nice um, online uh, service that uh, I also use. It's supported by many people, including the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So what it does is uh, you put your work out there uh, online, and uh, the website will track the hits, the number of uh, time people download your work and read your study. So, and it put the number out there. So, of course, uh, if you have something that is noticeable, uh, the number will go up quickly, and so uh, that makes you look good. So, so I think that's uh, um, in the. Um, 
internet age, uh, there, there are many ways um, uh, that uh, can help to get the, the knowledge and the information out. Um, so, so then, back to the uh, reputation of the uh, the journals. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, very important to protect the reputation because uh, that helps to bring the best work to the journal. Um, and um, uh, I mean, how do we do that? There are a lot of practical things that we need to consider, but it, I think uh, the the principle, the bottom line, is really that if we want to present the scholarly study, then we need to treat it with respect. We need to respect the peer review process. For example, I mentioned today I reject a, a, a invitation to, to review a manuscript, uh, partially because I, I uh, I have some reservation of the journal, but also, as I mentioned, I don't think uh, I'm qualified to review. You know, to re review manuscript is a, a um, criteria to evaluate our work. So if I review for a lot of journals that reflect my workload, so um, it, and also is a way to contribute to the society. So if I'm qualified, I would love to do that. But it, um, I think it's important as a reviewer or as a reader or the, uh, the people running the journal, we need to recognize that peer review is a very important quality control process to protect the uh, reputation of the, the journal. Um, you wanna go first? Okay, go. So I, I think that um, there is a very tangible ways to um, avoid the awkwardness of uh, problematic data sets, and that's, that is through co-production. There are multiple ways in which um, human geneticists can work with local communities to revise uh, old data sets, uh, old sequences, and rethink the extent or the informed consent both collective consent and individual consent for the future use of those sequences. And that uh, also can lead to uh, projects in which the communities have also a say in what the results are and how those uh, results are read, not only for uh, purposes of ancestry, but most importantly for biomedical purposes. So that's... Um, a project in which I've been um, been engaged with in terms of revising the data sets produced through software like uh, a structure developed by um, geneticists at Stanford uh, that can actually uh, produce interesting projects that will be more beneficial for the communities. But it demands, a, you know, like um, quite an effort from the point of view of the geneticists, but also a, a tangible interest from the point of view of the communities. There are some communities in Colombia that they are actually, they don't care. If the geneticists can leave uh, something tangible like uh, an electric plant, they are satisfied. I, they don't care with what sort of arguments they are going to come up about their ancestry or their biomedical status, but there are others that do care about that and they want to be on top of how to govern uh, those data sets. So I, I just have like a very simple answer, which is a, which is a total cop-out because I think STS allows you to do that. Um, but the answer being that when you, I, when I feel when I get caught in these flows between two countries doing scholarship and like when I feel really frustrated because nobody wants to fund this incredibly exciting, complicated project that I have. Uh, <laughs> And, and when I go out and learn about all these frustrations of data not existing, um, I have a very simple trick that has been taught to me methodologically, which is to look inward. Like the fact that these things don't exist or the fact that these things cannot be said aloud, right? They can only be said in a sort of intimate setting about how there, there are these problems, how there isn't money for some kind of work. These are things all of us know, but it's just something that you know, like nobody told you this when you were signing up for a grad program outside. 
But it, the best you can do is like transfer this knowledge on to other people and just kind of make them aware of what it really means to go somewhere else and you know do your education and come back. I think, yeah, there's not enough information about that outside. So I just try and tell everyone I know like what exactly will happen to you, yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, also uh, quickly, um, with respect to this question of what to do, um, I think this is one of the most important questions. I know we're living in times of despair. It's really easy to be very pessimistic. We mostly are at this point. Uh, but I, I tend to be very optimistic when it comes to these uh, political experiments that we are conducting through open access and free and open source hardware, software uh, development and open data. Despite all the uh, extractive, precarious work that, in many cases, support uh, many of these initiatives, uh, so uh, to to make this long story short, I, I can only speak about other than the the open uh, um, uh, the free and open data, uh, the the open access and free and open source world. Uh, I can only I can speak about the the the, the field of anthropology, and I think one of the uh, inspiring. Um, spaces for this conversation about how can we actually contribute as a positive force for social change through our scholarship is in the domain of uh, collaborative uh, anthropology, collaborative ethnography, which has um, a long trajectory and has many, uh, has uh, an, um, national histories because the discipline has these, you know, national formations. And But I think this is a very inspiring uh, place at, uh, speaking from 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 the from discipline of anthropology, because the, the 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 distinction between the expert, the researcher, and the group that you're working with is 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 questioned, problematized, and and work through the interaction that you in the ties that you build in the field. So this, I think, this is a promising. Um, uh, ex uh, scholarly experience, experience of research, and experience and political experience, and I think it's happening in the sciences, in many disciplines in the sciences as well, with community science projects, which are not limited to to uh, um, um, citizen science um, uh, experiments, but actually doing science with communities would have a very practical problem at hand. So I think we, we we're all uh, in in many ways participating in conducting these experiments in the in the sciences in the global south and the north. So I tend to be positive. I think uh, I'm optimistic, despite you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this panel, and I think let's uh, go have some drinks.